Our next speaker um, maybe needs no introduction, but I'll go ahead anyway. Uh, Bill Minter uh, began his career as the editor, writer, and photographer for the employee magazine of a large Chicago-based printing company. Shortly thereafter, he met Bill Anthony, noted fine book binder and book conservator who became his immediate supervisor. And within a short time, the young Bill began a seven-year apprenticeship with the master binder. Um, in 1978, Bill started his own book conservation practice in Chicago and later moved to Pennsylvania. In 2014, Bill accepted a position as senior book conservator at the Penn State University Libraries. Um, Bill is known for his inventive character with many different items to his credit. Most notable is the ultrasonic welder for polyester film encapsulation. And today, Bill will be talking about special collections, exhibits, and opportunities for a book conservator. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's certainly a pleasure to be here, and I thank Randy and, and also Seth for uh, uh, strong-arming me to come out here to uh, Salt Lake City. And fortunately, now that I'm at uh, Penn State, and I, I want to emphasize Penn State University, a few people have said Penn, and that's in Philadelphia, which is you know the big city to the east. Uh, and uh, Penn State is in central um, Pennsylvania, in the mountains. Uh, very lovely area, very rural, but um, I'm very thankful to, uh, as Justin has already pointed out, uh, with the Mellon funding, I am very pleased that uh, I have the position. Again, thanks to uh, the Mellon Foundation for um, putting up the million and a quarter dollars. And fortunately, within a very short period of time, the uh, King family came along and matched that, those funds. and. Uh, uh, just, in fact, uh, a week ago, uh, Mrs. King and her husband, Jeff, were there. And, um, you know, I was very appreciative, you know, for having this position. Because for all, most of my career, I've been in private practice. And uh, now that I'm at a university, uh, it really gives me some opportunities. And these are the sort of things that I want to share with you. Because, um, you know, when you're working privately, you know, sometimes you can get collaborations with scientists and researchers and everything. Um, but it's a little bit, somewhat a little bit easier when you're, you know, and I'm a faculty member uh, within the libraries, so, you know, I can go and talk with these people and get some information. And um, as Special Collections has asked for uh, me to assist them with some of the, the exhibits that have been put together, um, I have had some opportunities to you know, I haven't worked on many exhibits d during my career, but um, as I have ex seen exhibits, it's like, well, everything is kind of static and it's in a case and, you know, it's lovely and everything, but sometimes we want to handle things and, of course, can't do that. Um, but with the exhibits, and in fact, went to a, a um, I'm sorry, I should be s uh, starting my timer here, so I'm on, t on time here. With uh, uh, at the Folger Shakespeare Library, there was a conference recently about ex exhibitions. And I was really uh, intrigued by one of the speakers. And uh, about that same time, uh, an exhibit was going up. And in this case, Brent Wilson, his artwork was going to be shown. And uh, in fact, Brent Wilson was right here in Salt Lake City after he had graduated from Utah State. Uh, he was an art uh, instructor initially, and then he became, in 1957, he became the supervisor for the art programs here in the city. And uh, uh, he was here until 1966. Shortly thereafter, he accepted a position at uh, Penn State, and from 1974 to 2002, when he retired, he was at Penn State as uh, uh, a professor of art. Um, so when the, the uh, Special Collections decided to have an exhibit of his works, um, one of the items was his, uh, these letters uh, to Chairman Mao, which were all on a handmade paper made from, um, in, in Nepal. And as you'll see in the next slide here, ver at the very top up there, um, you can see that there are some 
actual thumbtack holes. And when they wanted to, um, when he wanted to put up these items, it was, oh, we'll just thumbtack them to the, to the wall. And uh, he wanted them to kind of float or fly. You know, as people would walk by, there would be some movement to them. And of course, now that these are uh, the property of the university uh, libraries, uh, you know, no way could that be allowed. And so the uh, curator asked me, you know, what, what can we do? And uh, so, so a couple of the other little restrictions were that we couldn't attach anything to the wall because painting the wall would, was going to be very expensive. So the only thing we had a, available to us was the, the picture rail at the very top. So I, I went back to my uh, very small studio uh, that were uh, available to us, and I started to put a few things together. Um, hopefully, many of you are uh, aware of Vivec, or uh, its generic name is PETG, available from McMaster Car and other suppliers. But if you want to get a small piece of it, McMaster Car is the place to go. But um, as you can see with this material, of course, using, oops, with, uh, with a, um, this metal brake here, you can actually take the material and bend it as you need. And the wonderful thing about this, you know, you can work this until you get it to whatever um, size you want. And so um, for the exhibit, was able to take, now all of this material up here is um, corrugated board just for demonstration purposes, but this was what I was ending up um, making and again, bending it on there. And this is the result, uh, which we call the flying folios. Um, there were six items there. Of course, there was a little bit of engineering to get everything to balance correctly because here's a nylon fishing line that goes up to the picture rail, again, along the top. And everything just hangs there very nicely. Now, uh, from a conservation perspective, of course, these are exposed, they're not protected in any way. They were secured with a piece of polyeth polypropylene ribbon, just in case somebody wanted to try to lift one off, they would, you know, there'd be a little bit of a, a delay. But um, just adjacent to this area is the um, reference desk. So somebody was kind of always keeping an eye on it. Now, of course, we could have put a, uh, one of the railings along the front, but we just thought, you know, for the people that we have coming through the area, mm -hmm. that that wasn't going to be a problem. So it was a, it was a lot of fun uh, going through this whole process. Another exhibit that followed maybe a year later was, um, as it states here, World War I in sepia. Now, the very interesting thing about this was that we heard some of the students say, now, where is sepia? I've never heard of that. <laughs> um, so um, anyway, the, uh, the exhibit was to show a series of glass slides that uh, came available to us from a company called the Keystone View Company. And apparently, these little glass slides here, lantern glass slides, uh, don't ask me for all the details about that sort of thing, but uh, the, these glass slides were available. Uh, they must have been sold in, in kits sort of things so that you could use them for educational purposes um, and whatnot. But the, um, the intention was that the, um, we would, we in our department, the preservation, conservation, and digitization department would take the glass slides and then make these prints, uh, as you see there. And from my perspective, it's like, well, you know, this, the prints are there, that's nice and everything, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could share a little bit more about the, the, the original, the glass slides? So I thought, well, could we take and use a strip LED light? Uh, I'm sorry I don't have a picture of it, but it's just a strip of LEDs that you can actually mount under a cabinet and whatnot. And uh, started playing around with this. 
Uh, this is a, uh, just another glass slide, not, not the originals here. And um, of course, this is all connected to a, a dimmer and then the power supply. And I found out that with um, this, that LEDs, they do give off a little bit of heat. And so in a confined space, there was going to be a um, potential problem. Um, it raises, if the lights are on for about eight hours, the temperature would go up about uh, 10 degrees. Certainly something to be concerned about. Um, now, I also um, realized that, you know, there's not going to be a lot of traffic through this area. So I've, I've figured out that I could put those LED lights on a motion sensor. So when somebody walks into the exhibit space and they come close to the cabinet, there would be a little click and the two little lights would pop on. And um, so, of course, in order to connect those uh, lights to a, a motion sensor, um, I had to get underneath the exhibit case and do this. And the curator happened to be walking by that day. And she was, well, she sent out this picture and said, your Mellon Grant dollars at work. <laughs> so here's a, a slide of more or less the, the finished uh, setup. Again, the, uh, the print and then the original glass slide here. Now, we ended up in this particular exhibit using the original. We have since found out that we could take that uh, very high quality uh, digital scan of the uh, glass slide, like 300 uh, megabytes. We could send that to a company and they would actually make a photographic film uh, uh, positive of that same image and the results are stunning. Um, again, for this exhibit, we only used the original, but uh, hopefully nothing happened to these items during that time. So here's the, uh, the finished display. And we did also have a little conservation area here on the side. So here's the display and then the conservation area just explaining to the viewer, you know, what some of the ways, if, if they had glass slides at home, what they could do to, uh, in handling them. But um, the, uh, again, the, the uh, two items were on display the print and then the glass slide. And then here's the entire bo wooden box, nice wooden box with uh, 100 glass slides. And then right here, sorry the slide is a little dark, but there's a little viewer, much like a pair of binoculars. And you could put the little view, uh, glass slide in there, hold it up to the light. There was a frosted glass there. And you could view the uh, actual slide. So, uh, 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 yes, so that was, uh, everything uh, in that one. Um, then here most recently we had um, an exhibit of exhibit of uh, children's toys a title called Playing to Learn and Learning to Play. And when the curator and I were looking at the items, she brought out this wonderful little um, theater, uh, shadow puppet theater setting. And um, this is kind of the view that could have been shown uh, in the, uh, the setup. And I point out that this is the instruction manual right here. And what it shows is the little box here. And there are two children sitting on stools. And they could use the, the puppet here with these wires. And they could manipulate it. And right here on the table behind it um, is a, a kerosene uh, a slide projector so that would project this light. Now, of course, we couldn't get some children to uh, help with this display and we couldn't have a kerosene lantern there. So we, and, and I felt that, you know, maybe we could do something a little bit different with this thing. Uh, again, this was all set up with the, the motion sensor. And so, uh, of course, we could have used the school teacher, but she didn't quite have the the uh, impact that the, uh, um, the next item had. So what we did is we took the, uh, um, the original paper cutouts, they were digitized, and we were able to take um, and digitally disassemble all of the different moving parts here, and then took the, uh, those um, tracings, and fortunately with collaborating with the uh, architecture fabrication department, they were able to take and do a laser cutout 
on uh, this black acrylic uh, plastic for us. Uh, this is being all kind of tested out here, trying to figure exactly what we would be doing. And right here is a, a motor, which this is the, the control board for this. Fortunately, I, had, I was able to collaborate with the, um, uh, an electrical engineer who knew how to get everything set up the right way. So uh, the motor here, this is a home-built camshaft uh, that uh, worked out quite well. And what the cam would do is lift this arm, and then there was another arm that came the opposite direction. And uh, back here on this piece of metal is a um, LED light. And so that's what's going on. And then here's kind of a, two still shots of what's going happening. And so again, the the little theater display, you could take, uh, the children could take this string right here and they could actually drop the curtain uh, for viewing and have their little show. But you can see kind of, shall we say, before and after here. And if everything works correctly, so when you walk in, you hear a little click, the um, lights come on, the, an action, and um, I could have done a little bit better with the timing, but you know, for a lot of people really enjoyed this uh, going on here. Okay, good. So, had that little video clip. The other part, and this is probably my favorite part of the this exhibit, was um, a book called Struhl Peter. I'm not very good with German. Struhl Peter, uh, or better known as Shockhead Peter, and. Um, we're gonna be showing here uh, Greedy Julia. She was really quite fantastic. We couldn't pass her up. But this is um, um, Shookhead here, and you can see in the next slide. Uh, this is how the book is um, available for children to, to view. Uh, there is a, a, a little poem over here, and Shockhead is here, and uh, I'm gonna guess his mother has a comb, and uh, Granny has a sponge, and so, you see this sort of thing going on during the uh, the work, or during the uh, when you pull when you pull the little tab down here. But again, Greedy Julia was really quite impressive, and this is again the page view, uh, the poem here, which I'll show in just a second, and then again the tab there. Uh, note that the um, the binding. This is all German, by the way, uh, all stapled together, and. Also note that there are little, these little spots here um, are actually wonderfully bent uh, uh, curlicue sort of wire that then goes straight down and then makes a curlicue on the opposite side of the paper. So that's the hinging point. And you can imagine that after a period of time, that single little fine piece of wire is gonna open up on, on the paper. Um, so anyway. So here's, here's the actual book, and let me just read the last part of this here. Uh, Julia, uh, Greedy Julia is home alone and decides she will treat herself to the honeypot, and at the end it states, something strange she found indeed, which should now restrain her greed. Pull the shaft and see how funny was the Greedy Julia's honey. So if you watch Greedy Julia, And that is a mouse coming out of the honeypot. And I really have to tell you that this particular slide was the still that was shown before and after. And as many of the viewers through the exhibit um, were, you know, what is going on there? Is she having a illness? So anyway, they decided. <laughs> They decided to change the slide to this particular one. Um, but again, you know, this is on view. You could only see the stills. Now, we could have done a video, but we thought we would go one step further. And again, with cl collaborations uh, on campus, went to the local Penn State um, Imaging Center, where they only have a million and a half dollar x ray device that's available. And fortunately, the uh, the researchers who run this piece of equipment, they were willing to, to work with me on this. And here's the machine. 
Of course, it all has safety features, so this door closes, and inside on this rotating table is the, um, the actual book. Um, and this is the image that they were eventually able to deliver to us. And here again, you can see the little black spots, which are the pivot points. And so we were able to take and get a tracing of those and you know, figure out what was going on because, of course, the Greedy Julia is on one page and then the back page is the next poem, and, but all of the mechanism, so to speak, is on the in interior. And we couldn't pull it apart to figure out what was going on, so an x-ray was really the best way. And again, being, part of, uh, being a part of the um, Penn State uh, 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 campus, uh, you know, having access to this was wonderful. So um, doing that, Again, I, I went back to my trusty um, Vivec, or the PETG, and was able to fabricate um, a double size uh, item. You can see the, the hand. This is the curator's hand down here in the, the corner. And we made a little extra tab so that a number of children that came through the exhibit, they were, you know, they were really intrigued by this. And um, it was set up on a pedestal and everything. So. That's what's going on. And as you can see there, oops, oops, sorry. So just by pulling on the tab, get that whole thing. And here's the two items from the same exhibit. Um, again, the, the uh, puppet theater is in the case here. And again, the motion sensor underneath. And Greedy Julia that you could actually play with. And then the, the stills up on the wall of, of the originals. So with that, I uh, thank you for your attention. And again, this was a first opportunity for me to you know, share some things uh, that we can do with um, collaborations on campus. And uh, in, in many ways, again, coming back to the, the conference that was at the uh, Folger Shakespeare Library, um, you know, what could, what can be done? I mean, obviously we're conservators, but um, are there ways that an exhibit can be enhanced so that it's to draw the, the viewer in, you know, in some ways? And in one uh, case, I have a couple of minutes yet. Um, uh, th there was a gentleman from Germany who was speaking, and he said that, um, you know, one of their challenges was they had a book and it had paper, I'm, I'm sorry, cloth samples, textile samples in the book. And it was like, okay. But what they were able to do is they digitally captured the different patterns on the cloth. And then behind the book, they actually had a little uh, stand of some sort, as I recall. Was anybody at that exhibit, uh, the um, Folger conference? Um, no one. Um, I'm trying to get a correction on, on my, um, my um, recalling what happened. But behind the book was a, a platform and they were able to project not only just the little fabric sample, but they were able to stitch all the things so it looked like a bolt of fabric right behind that. And to further enhance it, they had a mannequin set up uh, right behind that and they were able to project how that cloth might have used as a decorative such as on a dress, they could use it as a belt or whatever. And of course, we all asked, well, gee, that sounds like a lot of money. And the guy said, no, it was like $5,000. Now, of course, that's for one exhibit, but um, you know, for me, it's like, oh, now what could I do that would allow me to do something, maybe not $5,000-ish, but you know, are there things that we could do to help uh, with an exhibit? And uh, again, I go to look at uh, fine bindings or a, a rare books on display and you know you only see one portion of the item and you know is there some way that we could you know again draw the the um, the viewer uh, the exhibit goer into the exhibit a little bit further so anyway that's just the point that I wanted to make so And uh, just, I, I know that you have a little listing, but uh, uh, if you have any questions uh, now or later on, um, 
my website, my um, address is there. So it looks like we have a few questions, Claire. Um, I can just repeat your question. So unless I'm greatly mistaken, the Keystone Lab, uh, glass slide is staring at rocket slides. Yes. Was any consideration given to producing a way so that, oh, thank you. Um, the the uh, glass slides were stereoscopic slides. Was any consideration given to finding a way so that the public could actually view those stereoscopically because they are totally different stereoscopically than flat? Actu actually, that is ex the um, item that we were showing there was, um, I forgot to mention that the um, exhibit was the start of World War I in Europe. Um, and then just recently, we had the end of the war uh, for um, uh, 2017, 100 years. And um, so th we, I really wanted to, and that's why we got the photographic uh, reproductions of the glass slides. I really wanted to take those and make a little viewer and be able to take some of those, uh, what, uh, early 20th century viewers and then have LED lights in there so that people could literally take it off of a, a stand and view it. Time just ran out completely. I, I, but that is indeed exactly what I wanted to do because I wanted people to be able to see what would be viewable through the, uh, those if, things. If you want to do that in the future, you, you should give me a call. I'll give you my content. Oh, great, I, I just great. built a mobile stereoscopic okay, viewer. Okay, great, great. I'm a stereophotographer, so. Is there another question? No? Okay. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful um, presentation, bringing those objects to life.